I was fortunate enough to be invited to do the, a talk here at this meeting by Nicolas André. Um, he'd actually written a journal, uh, sorry, an article that was published in our journal f back in 2010. And we felt that that particular topic was worthy four years ago, and we wanted to have an update of that. So um, Nicola and Eddie wrote very recently, just online a couple of weeks ago, a lovely article for our journal on metronomic chemotherapy and said to me last year, would I be willing to do a talk? So I basically predicated the talk around um, the first half to give a bit of an overview, background of metronomic chemotherapy, the m mechanisms behind it, um, the, the sort of data that we have in the clinic for adults and paediatrics, a little bit of background to do with, um, you know, why there is a bit of cynicism or why it's an underappreciated field. And then a couple of slides to sort of talk through the ways forward. The second half of the talk I gave was more focusing on um, why we selected this topic to be covered in the journal, why it was important, how it filled a gap in the field, and then I went on to talk a little bit about, about what a nature editor re reviews sort of staff do at the journal, um, what, what the importance of a review article does, um, how it lends its you know, an extra component in the secondary content area to the field. And the other thing that we also um, wanted to cover in this talk was to give a nice overview of how we do commissioning, peer review, um, why it's important to attend conferences to understand more of the basic research and the clinical side of this area. And so that was the talk, really. Basically, metronomic chemotherapy is the um, the use of chemotherapy, but at a much lower dose than maximum tolerated dose, um, with uh, sort of uh, no sort of drug-free intervals, so it's fairly continuous. Um, and so, a frequent dosing means that the idea there is that it's based around um, sort of several components of its mechanism. So, it has an anti-angiogenic component. It also targets the immune system, um, and it also is looking at, or rather, basing its um, action on. Um, tumour initiating cells, some of the cancer stem cells, um, and it also has effects on hypoxia and tumour associated macrophages. So there are three or four areas, so it's effectively a multi-targeted type of therapy, it's not just singular therapy like targeted therapy. Um, and there has been lots of data in the last you know, decade actually, both in adults and in paediatrics that are coming out, showing that this, this approach is um, less toxic for the patient, that patients can um, endure therapy for a longer period, so there is a lack of tumour regrowth between drug breaks because obviously it's being continually dosed at a lower level, um, so it means that it can be helpful in the relapse and um, sort of uh, recurrence setting and for maintenance. Um, the other attraction is of course it's using chemotherapy drugs that are off patent or uh, that are very low cost, so therefore there is an advantage in low middle income countries as well as for uh, you know developed countries. Some of them are specific to certain cancers, so some of the original data um, were using you know, cytotoxic drugs in breast cancer for that disease, but we've actually had other studies doing repositioning of drugs where, or um, repurposing where drugs that are not used for the original therapeutic area in which they were initially developed are now being um, repurposed and used either in a metronomic fashion or in combination with normal conventional cytotoxic therapy or indeed angiogenic therapy or even immunomodulators so that they can actually um, effectively be prolonging survival in some of these patients. The dosing that is used in met for metronomic chemotherapy is, is fairly empiric, so it's not really well defined in the way that ma perhaps ma maximum tolerated dose um, dosing occurs in trials. So I think that one of the issues is that the, essentially the we still need to understand a lot more about how we dose, how frequently we dose um, with this type of therapy. So it's not necessarily as straightforward as perhaps or well as well defined. The other thing is metronomics as an actual term is not very well sort of published in the literature. So an awful lot of um, uh, people are reading papers on metronomic chemotherapy, not even realising it's metronomic because t titles of, of papers are say low dose or continuous or whatever. So um, there's a lack of appreciation of, of that particular um, sort of type of therapy in the field. And I think the other cynicism to do with um, metronomic chemotherapy is that effectively uh, it's, it's not actually um, 
being is embraced by the oncology community as it should be, um, because also there are you know unfortunately funding issues. So perhaps the um, use of metronomic chemotherapy is not quite as attractive from a sort of um, industry perspective, because obviously it's using drugs that aren't quite as um, expensive as some of these other newer therapies. Um, so a combination of you know definitions, how we dose. Um, and the fact that you know the terminology is perhaps not as well known within the field have hampered um, its its sort of um, uptake. Plus, in addition, um, we have a limited number of randomised controlled trial data with metronomic chemotherapy. I think that is beginning to now shift, and we are getting more data. But compared to conventional, it's still lower. Yes, I mean certainly there's a translational component, if you like, to uh, metronomic chemotherapy. So. As is often the case with cancer, the bench to bedside and back again approach is actually letting us understand the, the biology of the cancer in a better way. And certainly metronomic chemotherapy is not an, an exception in that regard at all. Um, I think we are finding that some of the mouse models that we're doing, and I think there needs to be more preclinical research actually in the drug de development process, both using conventional chemotherapy and or conventional agents, um, but certainly with um, metronomic chemotherapy, um, this is an area that we need to have um, perhaps a greater amount of investment in, in terms of resourcing and funding. But also, I think it's pro providing us actually with some really intriguing data and with things we're seeing in the clinic, uh, some of the successes, uh, are, are actually being shown subsequently with retrospective preclinical work to um, it, give us a better, better understanding of how this type of chemotherapy is working, which is, is great. I think metronomic chemotherapy has a, um, a very integral and important and vital um, part of our future in oncology. I've been to conferences in the last two years, ASCO, ESMO, and one of the biggest drivers of the discussions at these conferences has been we cannot afford cancer care anymore at the level we've been doing it for the last decade. It's spiralled out of control. Metronomic chemotherapy doesn't only offer um, cancer patients uh, potentially uh, um, response rates and survival benefits, it's doing so at lower toxicity. Um, it's also potentially beneficial in frail or elderly patients because they, those patients that perhaps cannot tolerate standard maximum tolerated dose chemotherapy, however, will benefit from metronomic chemotherapy. And let's not forget that cancer is a disease of the aging and it's becoming ever more important in patients of 60 and 70 years and older. Therefore, um, I think that the future for this particular treatment is going to be extremely important in terms of a fairly holistic approach um, and indeed because of its cost saving um, opportunities. My interest in coming to this meeting is that I can learn more about some of the scientific research and clinical advances that are taking place in this area that I would not ma manage to have obtained just through reading the literature alone. Um, so a lot of our commissioning that we do on the journal is predicated around um, making sure that we network with the community and t attend conferences to get ideas not only from listening to talks but actually from networking. Networking is the best way really in many respects to get ideas for the journal and already in the session breaks I've had some fantastic conversations with some of the speakers and attendees at this talk at this conference and I'm already thinking of other ways in which we would like to cover this particular topic in the journal over the next two or three years and in, and in the future. My career track or background is that I, I did a PhD at the Institute of Cancer Research Royal Marsden and it was actually to do with the WINT signaling pathway um, in the sort of breast cancer area but it was very very preclinical I wasn't I was doing sort of mouse work and cell line work um, but after leaving my PhD I decided I wanted to have a career probably in publishing because I decided that I didn't want to stay in the bench and I wanted to use my science background um, but in a way where I can potentially you know um, use it for the community in a in an area that I enjoyed, which was in fact writing up my thesis. Um, so I started at Breast Cancer Research as the editor of that journal for two to three years, then did a little stint um, for a medical communications agency. So I got exposure to the pharmaceutical pipeline and understood product life cycles much better than I would have done if I'd stayed just in academia. And then after that, I joined Nature Publishing Group and I've been there 10 years. I still love working on the journal. Um, we're celebrating our anniversary decade um, issue in November this year. Um, and I think that oncology 
actually is really exciting, but it's reached a frustrating crossroads. Um, and I think that the oncology community is actually faced with a, a lot of challenges, not just things we've talked about with metronomic chemotherapy with cost issues, but the drug development pipeline, how we conduct our clinical trials has to change compared to the days when we did this in a sort of more sort of systematic way with our older chemotherapy drugs. And maybe that returning back to old ways might actually be some of the ways in which we can advance the field actually. I think we can learn from the past as well as some of the exciting present stuff that's happening with some of our newer agents and with the genomics.